Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. This morning, as we begin our Sabbath school, shall we ask for the Lord's guidance? Shall we ask that his angels attend us? And shall we ask for his presence to be among us as we continue to look through the book of what many call minor prophets? Shall we pray? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that you have granted us to learn more about you. We thank you for this opportunity that we have to read in your word, to read in that of your prophet, to find as we search the jewels and the gold that have been left for us at this time in earth's history. Help us now. Each one of us needs you, Father. All of us have need of you in different ways. Direct us now. Show us that which we should do, Father, so that we may walk in your paths. You have promised that where two or more are gathered, there you will be also. I pray, Father, that you will be with each of us today as we open your word and as we seek your blessing. For this, Father, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Okay. What's the purpose that we've had over the last several Sabbath mornings in these studies? What, what have we been looking at? Well, this has been a message of reproof to this movement. From what book of the Bible? Um, from Zephaniah. Okay. So now, Theodore, on you, I'm going to impose a five-second rule. What does the name Zephaniah mean? Okay, I've left more than five seconds on the table. What does Zephaniah mean? <clears throat> Um, let me see here. Um, well, Yah has secreted or hidden. Okay. So it's about a hidden. It also can refer to treasured. So the idea of almost like hidden treasure. God has hidden. Yahweh has hidden. Yeah, and it means in the sense of uh, to protect. Right. Right. So something has been hidden like a treasure has been hidden, uh, secreted into a place. Okay. So this is a message for this time for this movement. Mm -hmm. God has protected this movement. Now, can you think of any other items that it is said that God has hidden from either scripture or from spirit of prophecy? God no, what I'm thinking of is, sorry, is Christ's parable of of the um, the person who sold his field to buy a treasure, because he found a treasure. Maybe I'm mixing up a couple of parables. There was a precious pearl, and there was also a, an unspecified tre treasure. 
that he had to dig for, obviously, or he wouldn't have found it. Now, while that might be the truth of this movement, I've got two other very literal applications. And I think that both are showing something in relation to this movement. One, Mrs. White is very clear. In one of her first visions, she was holding aloft a large Bible. What did that, mm -hmm. Bible, what did that Bible have in it? I, was that when she was pointing, like she had, had it above her head and she was pointing to each verse without being able to see them? No, she was, just, that she was holding aloft the Bible. A woman, a small woman, a slight woman, a mere slip of a girl, yeah. holding a Bible that weighs about 17 pounds, holding it aloft in one hand. She is pointing to it and stating the Apocrypha. The hidden book. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now there's one other item that has been hidden. We know this in scripture, but why didn't anybody think of it? Is not the Ark of the Covenant currently hidden? So we're told. Is this not? when we compare what's going on with this movement, is it not being then compared with the Ark of the Covenant? Because is not the Ark of the Covenant the revelation of God's character? It has the commandments from Sinai, it has the manna, and it has the rod that budded. Consider that, because I believe these symbols are showing that God is able to protect his people. God is capable in all circumstances to show us that he will protect his people and that we need to have faith in this. Now, <clears throat> as I have been going through what Mrs. White has written regarding the book of Zephaniah, God has hidden. It's interesting to me that when we choose to read these items in context, that so far, dealing with Zephaniah 1 alone, there's over 60 pages of different articles that give reference to Zephaniah in comparison with other books of the Bible. I have a difficulty then seeing this as a minor prophet where she has spent so much time and so much effort to leave for us words that are as a trail to that pathway that we need to be following. The article that is now before you, Manuscript 18 of 1899, written 3rd of March. 1899, previously unpublished, unpublished, unreferenced, hidden for today. And as we've noted in the past, this is also an article where one or more typed copies of this document contain additional Ellen White handwritten interlineations, which may be viewed at the main office of the Ellen G. White estate. Here again, not all that Mrs. White has written has been released to the public. What is the title of this article? The 
call to, call the, feast. to the feast. This is going to become very clear as to what she's doing here in just a moment. King, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding. And they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants saying, tell them which are bidden, behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed and all things are ready, come unto the marriage. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. And he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, the wedding is ready. But they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. Matthew 22, 2 through 10. There are many symbols within this parable. Christ himself stated, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. We are being invited to the wedding of Christ. This parable has invited people, invited churches for over 2,000 years. In God's time, this parable has been inviting people for two days. The wedding is ready. Are we? The king sent his messengers first to the higher classes, those who were called his chosen people. But these wholly intent on securing worldly gain sent in their refusal, saying, I pray thee, have me excused. Luke 14, 18 and 19. They did not feel sufficient respect for the master of the feast to respond to his invitation. They are represented by the words, them that are turned back from the Lord and those that have not sought the Lord nor inquired for him. Thinking their own wisdom sufficient, they have much to say as though they were oracles of wisdom. The Lord declares, hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord God. For the day of the Lord is at hand, for the Lord hath prepared a sacrifice. He hath bid his guests. And it shall come to pass in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the prince and the king's children, and all such are clothed with strange apparel. In the same day also will I punish those that leap on the threshold which fill their master's houses with violence and deceit. Zephaniah 1, 6 through 9. She's giving quite the comparison here. She's taking the parable of Christ and merging it with the warning of Zephaniah. What do we see in these two paragraphs? What specifically is being said to you and to your heart? Okay. 
where do you find yourself standing? Well, we don't want to be in uh, strange apparel. I know that. <laughs> okay. What else can we call strange apparel? Well, maybe ideas, strange doctrine, maybe, or uh, pride, maybe pride. And if, brother, we were to go back to the example of Aiken, what did Aiken desire? What did he try to hide away? Well, he hid away the. the and treasures. Did he not try to hide away the Babylonian garment? And is that not strange apparel? Yep. Yep. If we look to be clothed in anything other than the righteousness of Christ, we are clothed in strange apparel. If we are choosing to be clothed in apparel of our own making, we are clothed in strange apparel. If we choose that we wish to be like the world, we are then clothed in strange apparel. Can anything be more direct or more clear? The king said. When I'm reading, sorry, go ahead. I, when no, I'm, go ahead. the Lord has prepared a sacrifice, it brings me to Romans 12, 1 and 2, where we're, we're off or we're um, invited and we're commanded to present our bodies a living sacrifice. And he is preparing a sacrifice in the sense that. If we allow him to on a daily basis, he will prepare us to be fit for him when he returns, for, to be fit for eternity. This is very sobering. I agree. The king sent his messengers first to the higher classes. We can apply this with the children of Israel. In our time, there are other higher classes to whom this message was first given. Who could be represented as being called the chosen people. But these wholly intent on securing worldly gain sent in their refusal saying, I pray thee, have me excused. There are those that would seek to set aside the words of Mrs. White, just as others would choose to set aside the words of Zephaniah, because they believe in their own wisdom. We have seen this too many times. It's done very subtly and crafty, too. <laughs> Is that not the description that we have given with Parminder and the way he's approached things? Subtle and crafty? Yeah, yes. We've also seen this happen with others that choose to reject the standard that Father Miller presented that we need to compare one verse with another. One portion of the spirit of prophecy with scripture to see exactly what God is telling us for this time. We need the entire scripture, 360 degrees of scripture, 
the whole scripture to understand what is going on. All about the prince and the king's children are that that one is that referring to one person who had sired children? Could it be referring to Ted Wilson and his church, or maybe even his family? Punish the prince and the king's children. And then I'm thinking of Zechariah when he had his eyes cut out and after he saw his own son slain before him. I mean, that's a hideous, horrible death. Well, I have to ask a question. What else do we know about the man Zephaniah? Anything at all? I found it kind of interesting as I'm looking through names because when Nebuchadnezzar came to take Jerusalem, there was a listing of people that were taken captive by those Knezer. And if we were to take a look at 2 Kings 25, 18, we would find that this verse reads, and the captain of the guard took Sariah, the chief priest, and Zephaniah, the second priest, and the three keepers of the door. So five men served in the temple were taken by the captain of the guard. And out of the city, he took an officer that was set over the men of war and five men of them that were in the king's presence, which were found in the city and the principal scribe of the host, which mustered the people of the land and three score men of the people of the land that were found in the city. And Nebu Zardan, Zaradan, captain of the guard, took these and brought them to the king of Babylon to Riblah. And the king of Babylon smote them and slew them at Riblah in the land of Hamath. So Judah was carried away out of the land. Seventy-two men, five of whom served in the temple one of whom who was named Zephaniah were taken and slain in front of Nebuchadnezzar. Thinking their own wisdom sufficient, they have much to say as though they were oracles of wisdom. In preparing for these studies, I'm always being shown how little my wisdom is. There are so many points and so many warnings that Mrs. White has given that are not being considered at this time, either within the church or by those in the movement. This wisdom given of God is for us to consider. It is for us to accept. It is for us to eat so that it becomes part of us. <clears throat> when the princes of the land refused the invitation, the king sent his messenger into the highways, where were found those who were not so absorbed in the work of buying and selling, planting and building. 
Building transactions were not made of such importance that eternity was left out of the reckoning. The wedding is ready, the king said, for they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he said unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. The man was speechless. Then said the king, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into the outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Mentally, what do you see when someone is bound hand and foot? What symbol can we make from this? Well, their wisdom probably means nothing anymore. Okay, but if your hands are bound, can you defend yourself? Nope. If your well, feet, go ahead. Oh, go. No, I was, I was just thinking. If your feet are bound, are you able to walk? Nope. If you're unable to walk, you're unable to follow, you're unable to escape, you're unable to do anything. If you cannot walk or defend yourself, you are left helpless. You are shown your complete condition. Do we want to be bound head and foot? Do we want to be bound so that our hands and our feet are so tied that we cannot follow Christ in any manner? Tie our own hands and feet. Isn't that what we're doing at times? Yep. Yeah. This teaches us that there are those who come to enjoy the privileges of the banquet of truth who have not eaten the flesh and drank the blood of the Son of God. <clears throat> what does that one sentence say to you? Christ made it clear. You must eat my flesh and drink my blood. When those words were first spoken, those that had followed him turned away saying, this is an hard saying, who can hear it? And they walked with him always, right? No more. And they walked with him no more. And this is so sad because I'm dealing with a soul. In fact, I'm dealing with an entire family who's practicing this right now. You know, they're right, they live a few few minutes from me, and I'm I keep inviting them to the studies. And I finally said, Whenever you're ready, you're welcome. Still waiting. Okay. It is up to us individually to choose to eat the flesh and, the, and to drink the blood of the Son of God. We're not speaking of literally doing this. 
This is a spiritual action. Those that first heard this understood that Christ was speaking figuratively. And they still chose to turn away. They claimed to believe and teach the word to others, but they worked the works of unrighteousness. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Therefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, <clears throat> that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouths, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed into the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Ephesians 4, 20-32. The upper room became a place of confession, the admission of wrongs, the admission of sins, and unity. This was necessary to see occur prior to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Paul was seeing the effects of what went on in that upper room, even though he did not participate in it. And Paul writes to Titus, put them in mind to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Titus 3, 1 to 7. Those first called who refused the invitation represent the Jewish people. For this time, who else represents the Jewish people? There are symbols that we are being given, both in the past and in the very recent past. 
God declares, since the day that your fathers came forth out of Egypt unto this day, have I even sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them, but ye heard not. Jeremiah 7, 25 and 13. Had they heeded the call which meant so much to them, they could have united with the messengers in giving the invitation. But they, with one consent, they began to make excuses. Still the blessings of truth must be set before them to give them an opportunity to heed the message. Brothers and sisters, we are in the same position today. There are those that are giving excuses. Why unity is not possible. They're excuses only because pride has come in too much. May it not be said of us that this represents us who refused the invitation. The invitation was first given to those in the higher walks of life. The invitation was first given to those that had the greatest opportunity to open the word and to open the spirit of prophecy. Let the Lord's messengers bear this in mind. It comes to the shepherds of the flock, the teachers divinely appointed as a word to be heeded. Those belonging to the higher ranks of society are to be sought out with tender affection and brotherly regard. This class have been too much neglected. Men in business life and positions of trust, men with large inventive faculties and scientific insight, men of genius are to be the first to hear the gospel call. It is the Lord's will that men to whom he has entrusted many talents shall hear the truth in a manner different from the way in which they have heard it in the past. <clears throat> there are men of the world who have God-given powers of organization which are needed in the carrying forward of the work for those last days. All are not preachers, but men are needed who can take the management of institutions where industrial work is carried on, who can act as leaders, as captains, and as educators in our conferences. God needs men who can look ahead and discern what needs to be done men who can act as faithful financiers, as presidents of conferences, men who will stand as solid as a rock to principle in the present crisis and in the future perils that may arise. We need and have needed talent that was God's purpose that we should have. But so much selfishness has been woven into our institutions that the Lord has not wrought to connect with those with the work who should be connected with it because he has seen that they would not be recognized or appreciated. In many ways, we are seeing this exactly played out right now. Over the last several weeks, many points of light have come from the studies of chronology. Many points 
have been made based upon Collins studies, Odilio studies, Stevens efforts and studies, Theodore's efforts and studies. All of these are important for us to consider at this time. None of these points are to be put aside. There are conscientious men who have not yet seen the light of truth and who need to be taught. Those who have labored in the temperance cause, who in their work would have had the Lord behind them, <clears throat> should have had far more labor put forth in their behalf. We need to feel our responsibility in this work. Do not go to those in the higher ranks of life and call them in such a disrespectful manner that they will not listen. Those in the highways must first be warned. The teachers, the leading men among the people must be called. To them, the invitation must be given. They must be dealt with personally and earnestly. For if one teacher is gained, he will be able to communicate the light received to many others. More work should have been done for those in high places. Those who give the last message of mercy to a fallen world are not to pass by the ministers. God's servants are to approach them as those who have a deep interest in their welfare and then plead for them before God in prayer. If they refuse to accept the invitation, tell the master about it, and then your duty is done. Isn't it interesting that she gives a very specific consideration at this point? How many of us have made presentations with others and the presentations have been set aside? Tell the master about it. And then your duty is complete. Your duty is done. Lest we should think only of great and gifted men to the neglect of the, of the poorer classes, those who are in humble circumstances, Christ instructed his messengers to go also to those in the highways and the hedges to the poor and the lowly of earth. <clears throat> when those first invited refuse the invitation, the command is given, go ye to those in gross darkness. And as many as ye shall find, bid to the feast. This is the work we are to do. Labor is to be put forth for only one class. Labor is to be put forth for all classes. The guests who come are a mixed company. Some are true believers. Others have not on the robe of Christ's righteousness. Many will accept the invitation and apparently take their stand as believers who have not put on Christ. But the work of separation is not given to any human being. The servants cannot take the responsibility of refusing admittance to any who may come. Yet there is laid upon them the work of carrying out the Bible rule in regard to disorderly members. <clears throat> Those in the byways and the hedges came in response to the call of the messenger. They had no fitness for the feast in their common, inappropriate dress. And therefore, fitting apparel was provided to them. <clears throat> so we must all put on the righteousness of Christ before we may be ready for the banquet that he has prepared. As many have received him, as many as received him, 
to them give he power to become sons of God. John 1, 12. The humblest men and women have their appointed work. The most lonely, lowly, if they will receive the truth for this time, will be accepted by Christ to do his work. The Lord will do a great work through humble men in reaching humble men. He will accept the talents of the greatest men in the world, but if these refuse to return to him their entrusted gifts, he uses humbler workers. It is God who has given men all the power they possess. Those who refuse to use God's gifts in his appointed way will be left to their own finite wisdom to lose the powers they possess. God will accept the humble, patient, loving servants of a lowly people. <clears throat> Through the skill of a multiple of humble workers, he will carry out his work. Is there any more fearful statement presented before us at this time that those who refuse to use God's gifts in his appointed way will be left to their own finite wisdom to lose the powers they possess? What does that say to you? And what does it present before you today? Well, it certainly speaks to me personally because I've had a couple of strokes now and I did get a consult again. And, and so I'm taking what I ought to be taking to prevent them. And I know that there are various causes for these strokes, but one of them for sure, and I admitted this to Ken while I was flopping around, uh, I have too much pride. The Lord is dealing with me about my pride, right? I, I really realized it. Like I am so independent and self-sufficient. And this isn't the first time in my life he's had to smack me down. But because I was penitent, he is restoring me. And I just have to realize I'm walking a very fine line here. And he can take my life at any moment. He's got control of everything. And I just need to cede it all to him. I acknowledge him as my creator, my redeemer, my sustainer, and I don't dare step out of line. Not that I intended to step out of line that time, but it was a, it was a warning for sure. It's a warning to all of us. We just don't realize how frail we are and how sometimes really too independent, like too self-sufficient. Okay. Anyone else? <clears throat> now, Mrs. White merges Zephaniah 1, 6 through 9 with yet another passage. From the arrangements made for the building of the tabernacle, we see from whence man gets his strength his skill, his education. We read, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship to devise cunning works to work in gold and in silver and in brass and in the cutting of stones and to set them and in the carving of timber and to work in all manner of workmanship. And I, behold, I have given unto him Aholiab, the son of Hasamach, of the tribe of Dan, and in the hearts of all who are wise and hearted, I have put wisdom that they may make all that I have commanded them. 
Exodus 31, 1 to 6. Bezalel, what does it mean? I was looking it up, but I can't find it. Okay. <clears throat> that name occurs a couple more places within scripture. It is another pressing in the shadow or the protection of God. Zephaniah is that who God has hidden. Bezalel is in the protection of God. Does Bezalel not today? describe this movement correctly. For is not this movement protected of God? We've also seen that he has given him a holy ab. Now, it's interesting when we're looking at this. We have a different, we basically have these generations that are being mentioned. Aholiab, the tent of his father. Ahasamon, <coughs> the brother of support of the tribe of Dan. And what, of course, was Dan? Dan was to be the judge. But the symbol of Dan was that of a backbiter. But this portion of that tribe was the brother of support. Are we not to be supportive of our brothers and sisters? Yes. Um, even if they have... Even if we have character defects or whatever, we should be patient. Okay, I'm just yes, going, we all have character defects. That's a given. And just going back a little bit, um, Psalm 91. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> as you have, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Um, we're, we're probably familiar with this uh, psalm. Right. Um, so you have uh, the secret place. You have the shadow, which is what that's the root that's being used for um, Betzalel. Because um, bet, the bet that's the beginning there, that's just the in, in the shadow of God. And uh, it's that south. Sal, that's that word, that's uh, shadow, cell. And then you have the L at the end, which is God. Um, so this, of course, is talking about uh, the plagues that are going to fall. Right? All right. Psalm 91. I mean, that's how we've taken it. Um, it's also the one where... Uh, Satan quotes to Christ um, where he says um, um, talking about they shall bear thee up lest thou dash thy foot against a stone but of course Satan neglects the verse before that says for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways so he just quotes part of the verse. And uh, 
there's other things in here as well. But, but the general idea then is in order to be prepared for the time ahead, we have to understand the message now. How can you be a brother of support if you are not in unity with your brother? Mm -hmm. Because a holy ab had wisdom imparted to him for the support of Bezalel. Mm -hmm. Are not these men figures to what we should be seeing within the movement at this time? Mm -hmm. Zephaniah is giving us a warning of the day of the Lord. They are showing through Zephaniah that which has been hidden away by God. Christ must be all and in all. No eggs up here? No. You gotta go downstairs for him? Yeah. Okay, keep going. Christ must be all and in all to every soul. Those who try in their own strength to solve the mystery of the creation of men, the mystery of mercy and redemption, the mystery of eternity will be baffled. The wedding garment was prepared for us at infinite cost. It is the righteousness of Christ provided for every soul that comes to the supper. Those who have put on Christ have on the wedding garment. Is there anything more clear than what she's just written in this short paragraph? It is the righteousness of Christ provided for every soul that comes to the supper. <clears throat> Those that come to the wedding supper have to make a choice. If we're not willing to make that choice, we are not willing to accept the righteousness of Christ. The man who came into the feast without the wedding garment represents those who violate God's law. Think of that for a moment. It's if a we law of the coveting, the covet covers everything. If we violate the law in one respect, we violated the entire law. The man who came into the feast without the wedding garment represent those who violate God's law. Christ gave his life to make it possible for God to pardon sin. Violation of the law caused Adam to lose Edom. The disobedient can neither enter in through the gates of the city. The disobedient can never enter in through the gates of the city. In this statement, in this very direct statement, is Ellen white in disagreement with the Bible.
there would be those that would say that it is possible for man to enter into heaven because it is not until Christ returns that our character will be changed. Yet what we have been studying said that if we do not have the character change before the test comes, we will not develop the character after the test. We have our choices to make now. Because before the test, we must choose to accept the wedding garment offered. We must choose to accept the righteousness of Christ. The disobedient can never enter in through the gates of the city. They can never have a right to the tree of life. The Lord has made every provision that no one shall in any way dishonor him. He was provided the wedding garment, the righteousness of Christ, and it is essential that we be clothed with this garment, that we may show faith in Christ. Those who think they are complete without the righteousness of Christ will find in the end <clears throat> that they have lost their souls. Faith is made perfect by works. Those who make no change in character, yet claim the privilege of being called Christians, are without the wedding garment. They think that they are good enough, virtuous enough, in themselves. Without faith in Christ, they rest upon their own merits. True repentance for sin, they have never felt. Therefore, when Christ comes in to examine the guests, the command goes forth, bind him hand and foot and cast him into outer darkness. It okay. goes along with the uh, five foolish. Okay. Too many times I have heard People say to me, I'm a good person. I don't need all of these rules. I don't need all of these laws. I'm a good person in and of myself. When God comes, he'll see that I'm a good person. I don't have to wait. He'll know my heart. The problem is so many don't know their own heart. They are not willing to recognize the fact that their heart is deceitful among and above all things. Do we find ourselves in that class at this time? We need the righteousness of Christ. It has been freely offered. Are we willing to accept it? Many are called, but few are chosen. Matthew twenty-two fourteen. 14. This is a true statement of the final outcome. Many come in not having on the wedding garment. They do not accept Christ's righteousness. They have not repented and made peace with God. They have not received the free gift. Man is very dear to the heart of God. And all are invited to the feast. Those who clothe themselves in the garment provided find abundant entrance. 
as they receive the righteousness of the Savior, God places his stamp upon them. <clears throat> we are to receive Christ's righteousness as a free gift. And in receiving it, we acknowledge that in bestowing it, God confers on us a great favor. The wedding garment was prepared for us at an infinite cost. Only one can bestow this priceless gift, but all may receive it and thus become entitled to a place at the feast. The call to the feast is a call to partake of the richest spiritual provision. All who respond to this call find awaiting them an abundant supply of grace. And the more grace they receive, the more they desire. Those who partake of this feast may turn to their heavenly father and say, thou hast kept the best wine until now. <clears throat> How many different passages is Mrs. White comparing with Zephaniah 1, 6 to 9. Here we have the story of the king that looked to provide a wedding feast for his son. We have the story of the wedding in Cana here at the end. How many of these examples, of these parables, can we relate to what's going on right now? Well, probably all of them we would have to relate all of them are currently being shown that there is a great work to be done so that those among us may become the living stones of the temple that God builds without hands. The call to the feast is a call not only to a feast, but to the much higher calling. For those that will be of the living stones will be those that follow Christ wherever he goeth. And in this, I speak of the 144,000. There was no greater calling from this earth than to follow the Lamb wherever he goeth. We need to decide today for ourselves. if we're going to choose to accept the offered wedding garment, if we are going to choose for ourselves to accept the righteousness of Christ. We are currently in a school. We are being taught day by day of those things that need to be removed from our life and from our characters. What else are we to do at this time? We are to invite others. There will be those that accept. There will be those that reject. There will be those that say to us, I've received my degree. I've received my learning from other men. Therefore, I don't need your way. You need my way.
at this point and at this time. We cannot afford to accept the wisdom of man over that of God. We need to examine, we need to choose that which we are going to do. In the time we have remaining, do we have other questions, comments, or examples of what we have seen through this last week? Do we have reasons for praise? Do we have reasons to show that our Heavenly Father has affected us in some way this week so that we may share with others reasons to take heart that he is not abandoning us, that we are being led of him and being prepared by him for the message that is to be given. What say you now? I certainly have reasons to believe that God is with me. Okay. Anyone else? Well, he is so good to us. He, you know, we, we, we don't deserve it, but he is... He is there for us when we need him and helps us realize that we need him all the time. In my life, he's shown me more recently how spiritualism is invading the world so tremendously. We cannot afford to grasp the hand of spiritualism, just like we cannot afford to grasp the hand of papalism. So many are today. So many are choosing to follow spiritualism rather than to follow God. And they are being deluded. And it's a sad thing to watch. Choosing your own will over God's will is spiritualism. It's just a big facet of it. It sums it all up. And by choosing your own will over God's will, you are choosing the, the uh, rulership of Satan. What do we find when we choose his rulership? What do we experience? Increasing darkness. Just look at the world today. Look at ourselves today. I mean, I'm looking at myself and I'm thinking I am so on Christ like, and yet he hasn't given up on me and I'm allowing him to fashion me into his likeness. And it's a daily battle. You better believe I have a lot of attacks, but that shows I'm on the right path and he is keeping me. I experienced a a soundness in his word for one thing. Okay. I realized that it ain't that we ain't got much time and when every moment counts. Amen to that. We have choices to make. If we are going to properly represent Christ. We need that experience from 
eating his flesh and drinking his blood so that we may become more like him. We need to accept his words in such a manner that what he has said become part of us. If we're not willing to do that, then how can it be said that we have accepted his robe of righteousness? There are many that have been called to this feast. There are many that believe that membership within the Adventist church is their passport to heaven. Yet passages such as this, by them are placed aside because the learned men, those that are the leaders and the bright and shining lights within the church, don't view this as being important. Consider for a fact that this passage, written in 1899, Was, was being put away and not being published for 116 years. Why? Because it contains admonitions and instructions that in many ways are very different from what we hear within the church. And it cuts to the bone. Yes, it does. Is this a peace and safety message? Certainly not. So if this cuts us and cuts us right to our bone, does this not also cut us right where we live? Yep. Amen. Does this passage with Zephaniah 1, 6 through 9, not show us our great need of Christ? And applying the different examples, show us exactly what we need to be doing at this time. As this study has been progressing, the more I have looked, the more I have found. There are multiple passages within the spirit of prophecy that give reference to Zephaniah 1, Zephaniah 2, and Zephaniah 3. We have spent many Sabbaths now going over just what is found in Zephaniah 1. Where I'm being led at this point is to be able to put these before you in their context as they were written for your consideration. But I'm also being led to take the passages that we find in the spirit of prophecy and put them together with the direct passages that we find in the book of Zephaniah. So that both can be provided, printed, so that you can read these on your own in these considerations. 
Never forget that the purpose of this study is to compare these so-called minor prophets along with the book of Daniel. And if we're going to compare something with the book of Daniel, what other book are we also going to compare this with? Well, you got Revelation, Daniel. All of which have to do with the time in which we are living. The admonition of Mrs. White was that we should be comparing these so-called minor prophets along with the book of Daniel. But Daniel, Ezekiel, and Revelation each have very specific direction for us today. The message in this one passage is one that is very pregnant with warnings, admonitions, and blessings for us today. And there is much yet to be determined because we've barely gotten through half of what Mrs. White has written regarding this first chapter of Zephaniah. Any other thoughts or comments at this time? Any questions? All right, shall we then close with prayer? <clears throat> Gracious Father in heaven, the clarity of the warning provided by Mrs. White is now before us. We thank you, Father, for your inspiration so that we may understand this warning better, showing us in comparison with Exodus, in comparison with Matthew, in comparison with Luke, and in comparison with Ephesians and Titus, that which is to be important before us. Help us that we may be able to concentrate on that which is before us, to make use of the light that is behind us, so that we may more securely walk upon the path that you would have us to walk at this time in this earth's history. Be with us, each one. Direct us on this Sabbath. Help us so that we may worship you in spirit and in truth and may come into a full Sabbath of rest for our minds, for our bodies, and for our spirit. For this we thank you. For this we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.